An Indigenous person in custody is less likely to die than a non-Indigenous person in custody. So when people talk about this over-representation of deaths in custody for Indigenous people, that's because there's an over-representation of them in custody. Once in custody, and I'm not saying that's a good thing, that's bad, but once in custody, they're less likely to die than non-Indigenous people. It's, but, you know, the narrative is once they're in custody, they're at danger of being slaughtered and all that sort of thing. You know, it's a bit like saying my, among the Dillons, they're more likely to die in Queensland than they are in New South Wales. That's because 99% of them are in Queensland. My guest today is Dr. Anthony Dillon, who I've come to regard as a wonderful Australian, and you'll see why very shortly. He's an honorary fellow at the Australian Catholic University and an expert, amongst other things, in Australian Indigenous Affairs. He's been a regular contributor to public debate on Indigenous issues for over 25 years. He's written many academic articles and papers and dozens of articles for newspapers and magazines. Recently, he's offered some really intelligent and thought out ideas on the so-called voice to parliament uh, and ways forward more generally. So Anthony, terrific to have this chance to talk. Can we kick off? We're all products of our backgrounds. Yeah. Tell us a bit about how you grew up, how it fitted together with mum and your dad. Your dad was pretty well known, pretty respected person in Queensland and across Australia, uh, and your community. Tell us a bit about sure. it. Sure. Um, well, it's interesting because when I talk about Aboriginal affairs, which we'll get into shortly, I always say the ones who have made it have either been born into good circumstances like I was, so that's what I'll talk about now, or they've escaped bad circumstances. So yes, I stayed up front. I was born into very good circumstances. So an uh, Aboriginal father, English mother, two great extended families who were great role models for me. I was taught what was, you know, what was right and what was wrong. The examples were set for me. And there was very little about race or culture. I was defined in, or you know, your sense of self-worth was defined in your contribution to others. And so when you had this input from two great families, that's a pretty good beginning in life. And then of course, as you alluded to with my father, uh, his accomplishments as Australia's first Aboriginal police officer, uh, his commitment to honesty and integrity in the police force, saw him give evidence the first one to step forward and give evidence of corruption, first honest officer to step forward and give evidence of corruption in what was called the Fitzgerald Inquiry in the Queensland Police Force back then. That must uh, have required a lot of courage. Yeah, oh, very. So did he model courage when you were yes, growing up? Yes, yeah, backbone just, uh, and he had good role models too, his yeah. family and parents too, so it's mm. trickled down, I hope. Uh, so yes, took a lot of courage knowing what the consequences could be for uh, not, you know, taking bribes and that sort of thing. One thing he did have on his side was not only courage, but good physical stature, which um, opponents had to consider very carefully. I wouldn't take you on either. <laughs> you probably can't see it on the cameras. <laughs> cameras deceive people, yeah. but uh, I wouldn't take you on. Yeah. I wouldn't want to meet you on a dark night if you were in a bad mood with me. <laughs> you got me laughing now, you're, you're taking me off track. Uh, I'm a fairly harmless butterfly, I think. <laughs> So yeah, good role models, uh, both from the Aboriginal and the non-Aboriginal families. And it was about, you know, serve others, get an education, work hard, that sort of thing. It wasn't about your race, about your colour or anything like that. I've got cousins on both sides of the family and we're just, you know, all see each other as, uh, as equals. See, that, you know, I can relate to that at one level because I grew up in a rural community with a lot of Indigenous people. I went to primary school, a lot of Indigenous uh, you know, kids. Um, and it was kind of never an issue, and now it's becoming one. And I'm seeing it being more of an issue for my kids' kids than it was for me. And how does this happen? More generally, how did you come to be a commentator before we go to there? You, oh, you've become I... a commentator yes. on this because uh, you've just said it wasn't an issue growing up. You all just got on. So, Well, it was accidental, I think. I yeah. got a job in the Queensland Government in the Health Department. 
and I was looking after data, collecting and analysing data. And so you get to know what the big issues are. And Queensland Health, to their credit, made Indigenous health a big issue. That was one of their, their leading mm. causes. And so I got to learn about the problems facing Indigenous Australians, got to know all the statistics, the problems, the contributing factors to poor health and what the solutions are and all that sort of thing. So it was good education for me. But what I found was, in addition to reading the data, I was reading policy statements and documents. And I was seeing very often, you know, you'd pick up a policy and there on every page was, Indigenous people should be looking after Indigenous affairs. Indigenous people are the ones to handle these things. They've got the answers. What we hear today in the voice, which we'll get onto later. But back then, and this was before I'd heard the term identity politics, I was seeing it in black and white in the policy statements about you've got to have Indigenous people taking care of Indigenous matters. And I thought that just doesn't make sense to me because I was raised in a home where if you had a sore tooth, you'd go see the dentist. You didn't care what nationality or race they were. You just wanted to hope that they were good at teeth, understanding teeth. And you know, so whatever service provider we went to, it was just who was the most competent, good value, that sort of thing. I was, I was never told, well, son, you know, you need to see the, this indigenous person sort of thing. Yeah, that's what I was seeing in documents when I was working for the government way back then. And I started to react against that. And it was just at a time, or just shortly after, the internet came onto the scene. So I was able to start Googling things and uh, finding out, yeah, this sort of thing was happening in America, um, you know, where there's a separation and that sort of thing. And then I found a small group of people uh, led by Gary Johns, actually, in the Benilong Society, who had similar thoughts to me. And that was the first time I knew someone else uh, thought the same way, that recognising the commonalities between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people far outweighs the differences, and that is a much better way to address Indigenous issues. Yeah, it does strike me. We've got this terrible problem in Australia now. It's not just this particular divide we're talking about, it's everywhere, mm. where we constantly prey on the differences and ignore the, the massive things that we all share in common as Australians and can celebrate as Australians. We yeah. never celebrate anything now. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm not opposed to recognising or even celebrating differences only after you first recognise the commonalities. But far too often, I see individuals and groups defined in terms of their differences, and I don't think that's helpful. Yeah, it hardly leads to unity. But you've mentioned America there, and Thomas Sowell, who of course mm. is an African-American, and a, must be one of the most powerful minds of the 21st century, oh. or the 20th century. Yeah. Massively powerful mind. But he famously said this, racism is not dead, and remember he's talking about America, mm. but it is on life support, kept alive by politicians, race hustlers, and people who get a sense of superiority by n denouncing others as racist. You, uh, is Australia racist? Look, and uh, second, um, who are those that I think you've called blacktivists? <laughs> Look, he may have been talking about America, but yeah. it just fits the Australian context so well. And so, you know, is there racism? Well, there's pockets of racism, as there is in every group. But to call Australia racist because of that, or in particular white Australia racist um, because of isolated examples, is just not warranted. And uh, the analogy I use is I could point out some wealthy Indigenous people Okay. And you know some of them are architects of the voice. And there's nothing wrong with them having a good income. They've they've earned their positions. But it would be dumb to say indigenous people are rich, based on that sample. Okay. And I think it's dumb to say Australia is racist, based on a very biased sample of only a few individuals uh, who could be called racist. And you know even them even then they're, they're often not racist. They're just you know, say some dumb things, but someone wants to slap the racism article on there. So short answer, no, I do not see Australia or white Australia as a racist uh, group of people. Something else that occurs to me, and I often think about this, racism is, is a greater evil. I've, you know, I've, I'm a lover of history. I'm fascinated. And also, a, a greater evil is false allegations of racism, and that's the problem we have now. Yeah, but that's, that's a power tool. Hmm. I think yeah. it's you know, just as serious, if not more serious, 
to make a false allegation of racism than what racism is. And that's is. one of the things that distresses me. It's being bandied around everywhere at the yeah, moment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, historically, I, I, I'm a lover of history. And I stop and think of the unbelievable progress in the greatest human rights movement of all times, which was the ending of the African slave trade. Mm. When you basically had, <laughs> inconveniently, a bunch of wealthy, privileged, white Christians mm. leading the charge to say, if you like, um, there's no difference between the value uh, of, um, of a person based on their skin. Mm. Uh, the greatest anti-racist movement of all times. And yet now, as an academic, you'd be aware that cynical theory, or critical theory, sorry, mm. <laughs> Christian cynical theory by, by people who understand it well, uh, in our universities now spilling out into the community, teachers that all whites are racist, and particularly male whites are racist, but no one else is racist. Mm. I mean, it's a nonsense, isn't it? Because if racism is a form of hatred of other people, hatred is pretty prevalent, mm. it seems to me. It, and yeah. identity politics stokes hatred. Absolutely. What's the difference between hating somebody just because you disagree with them and hating somebody because of the supposed difference in the colour of their skin. Yeah, hate is hate. Hate is hate. Mm. But we don't talk about that. No. You know, and there's a lot of hatred. There is, I'm going to say this, I don't think Australians are particularly racist, pockets of it, but we're getting pretty good at hatred, Anthony. Mm. Well, um, the hatred could be, some of it could be frustration, which yeah. looks like hatred, I guess, when people are, you know, particularly non-Indigenous people are told all the time, you are the perpetrators of violence, Etc. You're the cause of problems for Indigenous people. You know, they might get frustrated with that, mm. and sometimes it spills out to hatred, perhaps. Yeah. Well, nothing. I mean, what do you think? Does hatred do hatred do more damage to the person who hates or the person who is hated? Uh, look, I would both, but I would probably lean towards it to the person doing the hating. Yeah. It keeps a cycle going. It does. Uh, the target can. They can have some psychological defences. Yeah. Mm. Uh. In 2020, there were Black Lives Matter protests in Sydney. And one of the major grievances was this Aboriginal deaths in custody. Any death in custody is regrettable. Mm. But then it's regrettable if you've been put into custody too, because it means you've done something pretty bad. Um, but for decades, Australians have been led to believe there's a crisis of Indigenous deaths in custody. You, you've been challenging that for many years. Mm. Why do you challenge that? Because an Indigenous person in custody is less likely to die than a non-Indigenous person in custody. So when people talk about this over-representation of deaths in custody for Indigenous people, that's because there's an over-representation of them in custody. Once in custody, and I'm not saying that's a good thing, that's bad, but once in custody, they're less likely to die than non-Indigenous people. It's, but, you know, the narrative is once they're in custody, they're at danger of being slaughtered and all that sort of thing. And you asked me about blacktivists before. Blacktivists are those people who promote those lies and myths that Indigenous people in custody are more likely to die than non-Indigenous people in custody. They are not. Absolutely, they're more likely to be in there, and that's something that needs to be addressed. But um, the over-representation of deaths is a reflection of the over-representation of them in custody. You know, it's a bit like saying my among the Dillons, they're more likely to die in Queensland than they are in New South Wales. That's because 99% of them are in Queensland, not New South Wales. Does that analogy make sense? Yes, it does. Yes. Yeah, I get what you're driving at. Mm. Um, and so the real issue should be, why are so many young Aboriginal men particularly in jail? Mm. And embarrassingly, I've had Aboriginal women say to me, we think there should be a few more in jail. Yes. And, um, it's not a popular thing to say, no, but they're not. saying it for a very profound reason. Ab absolutely. Violence. They're saying the law of the land should be upheld. Mm. And I don't hear, we'll get onto it later, but one of the reasons that I, I, I'm so sceptical about the voice is I don't hear its proponents saying they're going to tackle this issue of the safety of women and children, particularly in the children's formative years, because I would have thought that's such an important area. Mm. Absolutely. There are some... Ugly things we don't like to hear about, but yeah. they do need to be addressed. We can't just be ostriches. Children with STDs, mm. as a medico said to me the other day, a medico who has spent a lot of time working in Indigenous communities, she said STDs 
in children, it, it, she said it doesn't, her words, jump off the shelf, you know. <laughs> yeah. And uh, she was a, raising it, a very important point. Yeah, it's a tough is issue that needs to be addressed. So when I heard the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs saying that she would ask the voice, this was in the, again the, in the context of people saying, well, the voice can talk on anything it likes. She said, no, I'll ask them to focus on education, health, jobs and housing in remote areas. All good things. And everybody said, mm -hmm. well, that's good. Mm -hmm. But my argument would be if you don't firstly address the safety, emotional, physical, moral safety of children brought into the world first, no use addressing those other issues because those young people are not going to be able to take advantage of it. Sure. Uh, we need to intervene at various stages and at various mm. levels too. So I, mean, I think you know the big thing factor in addressing Indigenous disadvantage, whatever you want to call it, is once you get some good things in place like parents doing something productive, meaning meaningful jobs, kids in school, a lot of those other symptoms of bad behaviour, suicide, that sort of thing will start to evaporate. Mm. Does that make sense? Yes, it yeah. does. So, you know, you see those things there are, well, look, it's been said before, you get a, you know, 100,000 non-Indigenous people in a place where there's no work mm. and people sit around and get mm. paid to sit around, you're going to ha have bad problems, you know, it'll eventually... Sit down money. Yeah. It will eventually decay into just... That's not my term, that was Noel Pearson's term. Yeah. It's destroying his... Yeah. It'll, you know, those white people, their behaviour will decay into bad behaviour. Um, so what we have is not, not really an Aboriginal problem, but a people problem. We need the people mm. to be, yes, living in safe home structures. We need them to engage in society productively, doing things that help mm. others and society, have the kids in school. And then all those other bad things you'll find start to drop off. And yes, we do need to intervene with the law of the land. Uh, so it needs to be approached at a few levels. The anthropologist uh, uh, Peter Sutton observed recently that the determinant of whether a kid was going to make it, so to speak, mm. had nothing to do with skin colour and everything to do with family and community. And yet it seems to me that the progressive movement will not talk about the need, just they will not go there, talk about the need for children to have a secure environment and preferably live in an environment where they've got their mum and their dad. Yeah, they absolutely. will not talk about it. Yeah. And yet it seems to me to be a critical part of this problem. Basic. Yeah. What's wrong with our culture that we will not talk about this when the evidence is overwhelming? Mm. If you want to keep kids out of jail, particularly young men, you make sure they've got an effective father figure. Mm. But you're not allowed to say that. No, absolutely. Because uh, again, it gets painted as racist. Uh, so I guess we've got to emphasise, you know, this cuts across all cultures. We're not just, we're point. not just singling out Indigenous people. We're no, just we're saying that it seems to be more prevalent there for various reasons. Uh, so let's address it at, you know, across society. Mm. You've actually commented, this is very interesting, um, that misrepresenting Aboriginal deaths in custody could actually be to the detriment of Aboriginal women. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's something a lot of us know, but I first learned that it was, there was a story published in The Australian, there was this woman who was the principal solicitor at a w Aboriginal women's legal service. And she said, so it's not me saying it, she was saying she's got Aboriginal women coming to her saying that they're concerned about if they report their man for misbehaviour, misbehaviour being a euphemism for yeah. violence, yeah. they're afraid, oh, well, they'll end up in custody and if they end up in custody, they'll die. No, that's that fear is based on the lie that once in custody you're more likely to die. So that's the sort of problems it has. You know, when you spread that lie that, oh, a man who goes to custody, again, we're not wanting to put Aboriginal men or any man in custody just for the sake of putting them in custody. It's, you know, we have the law of the land, we've got to protect society, etc. Mm. Um, and sometimes it's, it's got to be done. And it's good to know that if it for an, an Indigenous man, at least anyway, if they go into custody, mm. um, you know, they're not going to be slaughtered or anything like this. I jokingly said with Dave Price, who, you know, Jacinta's mm. father, who's a great man, I said, statistically speaking, Dave, if you and your grandsons end up in custody, you're more likely to die than your grandsons. Now, of course, age is a factor, so, you know, mm. but, you know, if you level out age, Dave being a white man, 
is more likely to die than his Aboriginal grandsons, just statistically speaking. Interesting reflection, isn't it? Mm. Let's try and tease out a bit more, though, this issue, because it, it is real of disadvantage. I mean, the, you know, in, in, but, it's, but it's uneven, as I think Stan Grant said to me, I don't think I'm misquoting him, that there are 30,000 Indigenous people now with degrees. I've heard others say even more. Yeah. And they've mainstreamed. I met one the other day, a scientist. And he's, 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 interestingly, he just said to me, quietly, he said, I'm actually against the voice because bad things have happened. But I've got a degree, I've got a little business, I employ people uh, and I and my family love our lives as Australian and we do not want to be marked out. Those were his words. Uh, but any Australian with half a heart has to be concerned about the issues that are given rise to the voice, if you like. The communities where they're not doing well, and we've touched on this, let's tease out where you would really start if you wanted to make a difference. And I see, I have this great problem. I don't know how governments and bureaucrats and elites can go out and actually say to people, change your behaviour from on top. But somehow it has to come from within. Sure. But how do you do it? How do we inculcate it? How do we encourage it? Well, if we can point out to them role models, people that are similar to them who have come from yeah. their communities or communities like theirs, where they can let them know, hey, you can succeed and still be proud of your culture and have, you know, if you want to call it a connection to country, you can do that. And you mentioned Stan Grant a minute ago. There's a great clip I saw of him from about eight years ago where David Spears yeah. was interviewing him. And Stan made the point that he was, you know, lived on a mission. His father had to move the family around to where he could get work. Yeah. So the father, and I've seen my relatives do it, too. You know, they move around to where the work is. And Stan made the point, you know, you can move from being off, you know, move from country to wherever and still have that same connection. You don't lose your culture. And that's a point made by Stan. So sometimes we do need to look at these areas where the, the employment opportunities are limited. For, you know, first preference would be to try and get employment in there. And Warren Mundine is good mm. with this. He believes it can happen in, in every community and he's more optimistic than me. So we should try that. But I suspect there may be some communities where it's not viable to set up enterprise business and that sort of thing. And you need to give invitations for them to move, not necessarily to big cities, but just somewhere where there's more opportunity to yeah. access good services and contribute to the society, i.e. jobs, that sort of thing. I once visited a really remote community south of Halls Creek, really remote. And a lot of money had been spent on housing and schools and what have you, and, but it was still a very sad community. And as we went in, I thought, how am I going to connect with the people in this community when I look like, dare I say it, a politician and I've come from the south and they know I come from Canberra and they're going to think, ah, here comes another you know, naive person who's going to tell us all how to do it. And I thought, oh, the kids are the best chance. We can all connect via kids. So we, I went to the school playground where they were, they'd actually set up the kids. And uh, uh, it, it, it was, <laughs> you know what Indigenous kids are like. I sat down, picked up, a, you know, on the big tarpaulin and started reading nursery rhymes. And they're all watching their big eyes. They all move in closer. I've got the photographs to prove it before I knew it. I'm at the bottom of a ruck of about 30 kids. Mm. And we're all laughing, all having a great time. It's so, a common experience. Yeah, that's right. You know what it's like. And, and it was, it's, uh, I've had enough of it to sort of see how. And those kids hadn't been indoctrinated yet. No. But here was a really interesting thing. I looked around and I actually said to the elders, uh, there were three teachers at the school uh, doing a great job, great sense of vocation. Um, but I said, where are the older kids? And the elders said, um, we don't want them here because there's no jobs. We've, we've mm -hmm. taken every opportunity to get them away to boarding schools down in Alice Springs and Adelaide and Perth. Mm -hmm. There's nothing here for them. They were being absolutely realistic about it. And yet, if I were to come back down here and say, that's a community that doesn't see a future for itself, that in itself would be 
I'd be painted as racist for saying that. But that's yeah. what they said to me. Mm. So yeah, it um, does make a difference. It, well, it shouldn't, but it does seem to make a difference who says these things. Mm. I've often thought about that because it raises the assimilation versus you know separatist model that's been mm. a source of a lot of argument over time. So you've got a lot of indigenous people actually basically looking just to move into mainstream Australia and be Australians. Yeah, and still be proud of their culture if they want to celebrate that. Yeah. But seeing themselves as Australians first. Just before we come to The Voice, which I'd love to seek your views on, um, can we just focus a little bit more again on something that's... Because I represented so many Indigenous communities over such a long time. Regardless of your cultural background, it has been the norm in all societies that have worked, if I can put it that way, that you accept responsibility for your kids. And what I saw so often was that all the old taboos had been forgotten and all sorts of licentiousness had been opened up so that, there's no other way of putting this, far too many young men seem to feel they can bring kids into the world and accept no responsibility for them at all and in fact often be very damaging. Mm. And there was a famous leaked cartoon that drew attention to this. Mm. Um, you know, the, uh, an Aboriginal or an Indigenous policeman confronting an Aboriginal man who'd had two months to drink saying, here's your boy, look after him. And it was painted as racist. I read an article at the time when everyone was saying it was a racist cartoon saying, don't you understand that Indigenous women everywhere have been trying to get this issue opened up and finally a cartoonist does, does it and all the civil libertarians want to shut it down. Because mm. the point of the cartoon was, we want our young men to accept responsibility for the kids they brought into the world. It yep. just seems to me this is a really key issue. Do you have any thoughts oh, well, on... Well, I've got a better story about that cartoon. Right. You want to hear it? Yeah. I would read the papers at 12 o'clock each night and I have a network where I'd send out articles of interest, you know, if it had something to do with in Indigenous issues. I saw that cartoon and I sent it out to my network. It was just uh, a good cartoon that reflected what was happening at the mm. time. thought nothing of it sent it to my father and he said it was a great cartoon. That morning, Bill Leak phoned me to say he's being hammered for it. Bill and I were good yeah. mates. I said, what for? And he was telling me the story. I thought, that's strange because it was just reflecting what was yeah. the news stories at the time, you know, kids getting in trouble, that sort of indigenous kids in Central Australia. I mentioned it to my father. My father phoned up Bill gave him support and praise for the cartoon. And Bill went from here up to here, and he would just tell people, well, Cole Dillon supports the cartoon. Yeah. And I also had a conversation with Ken White about it. He said there was nothing wrong with the cartoon. The cartoon went to the heart of the need mm. to recognise the great losers in all of this are the kids. And it raises something else for me that makes me actually really angry. All we want to do is condemn previous generations for what's gone wrong today. Mm. We won't accept responsibility for what we're doing today. And I stop and think, I'll be blunt about this, Canberrans are going to vote overwhelmingly for this thing. We know that from all the research. Canberra's been responsible for refusing to listen. That's a very blunt assertion. Mm -hmm. But basically, too many people in that place. To listen to the issues of um, alcohol restrictions, to containing gambling. You go to Alice Springs and, you know, I've talked to kids outside the casino at half past 11 at night looking miserable and I say, what's going on? They say, oh, mum's in there mm -hmm. putting the paycheck down the poker machine mm -hmm. and I'll go to school hungry tomorrow because she will have spent it all. And the day after that I'll be so hungry I'll break into the tuck shop and then I'll be up before the cops. Mm -hmm. That's what a boy said to me. And, but in the name of civil liberties, no, 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 you can't. In the, name, in the name of political correctness. Yeah, that's right. So, so we've got this great problem. We won't confront what we've done. We've not upheld the law of the land. Mm -hmm. When a two-year-old presents with an STD and nobody's brought to justice for it. Mm -hmm. What are future generations going to say about the way we have failed in our responsibility as a society? To Absolutely. Say? I've had uh, one police officer and one social worker tell me they believe this seeing it happen that you have indigenous adults now mm. 
who are complaining, saying, when I was a kid, I should have been removed. I should have been taken better care of. So I would not be surprised if we get that avalanche of lawsuits one day where you get this generation of Indigenous people say, I shouldn't have been left in yeah. my culture, in my home. I should have been put in a good home. I should have been rescued. I should have been saved. Even more basically, why was the law of the land not upheld? Why was it a blind eye turned to the fact that I was being abused? Exactly. My life ruined. And my point here, and it's a really important one, we seem to lack the humility now in modern Australia to say we're not getting everything right mm. because all the blame for what's happening here belongs to our forebears. It's all about frontier violence. Mm. It's all about dispossession. I'm not saying they aren't real issues we need to address, but we won't accept the responsibility for what we're sure, doing. Sure, look, and I look at it this way. I mean, colonisation, that's one factor. Okay, but there's many other factors, yeah. and we know that there's many successful Indigenous people who are, you know, seem to have dodged this colonisation bullet. So it doesn't explain everything, doesn't explain a lot. But to me, it's a bit like a fire. If there's a fire raging and I want to put it out, I'm really not concerned about the initial spark that started that yeah. fire. I want to know what is the current oxygen source, and I want to starve that fire of the mm. current oxygen source. And that's what we need to do. What is sustaining these problems today? And it's political correctness. It's governments that lack a bit of backbone. Um, it's the obsession with romanticised culture. It's the obsession with sim symbolism and that sort of thing. Romanticised culture. Um, I grew up in the Gunnedah area, went to school in Gunnedah. Mm. Gunnedah is enormously proud, the locals, uh, of um, the story of the Red Chief. Now, he was a, an indigenous leader of that tribe lived about the time that Captain Cook sailed up the east coast of Australia. And a fair income, full-size hero. It's an incredible story. But as you read the story, it was written up by Ian Idris, but it's historically, it was, you know, that incredible oral history capacity. Every mm. tribe had an oral historian. And they, you know, they would pass on the stories from generation to generation with great accuracy. Um, and that's common to all cultures pre-writing, as I understand it, or most of them. And so you've got this extraordinary story that was set out by an early police officer talking to the oral historians of the local tribe. And what strikes you about it is that you have this man who saved his tribe from internal corruption. The politicians, the elders, had become very corrupt and they were pinching all the young brides the young men were restless and unhappy. The tribe was in terminal decline. That's the story. And along comes a hero, turns it right round. You know, every culture has those stories. So there's the good and the bad. And he eventually saves his tribe from takeovers, from surrounding communities. What's my point? My point is that every culture has good and bad stories, heroes and villains. We shouldn't romanticise. We ought to be saying, Let's put our accumulated learning, if you like, into the common pot and learn from the bad things as well as the good things. And this idea that the dividing line between a good culture and a bad culture, in this case, lies between a romanticised view of Indigenous communities in the past and the terrible, terrible uh, colonisers uh, that we all are. Mm. That's just a route to hatred and standoff uh, division an endless uh, uh, conflict, isn't it? Yeah. Look, anyone who's done a little bit of study or, say, picked up Peter Sutton's book, Politics of Suffering, knows that while pre-colonisation traditional Aboriginal culture certainly had aspects of beauty about it, there were some you know, very rough times there and things we don't like to talk about, which we're not going to in this session. People can do their own research. And, you know, white culture is no different if you go back. So we're not, we're not picking on indigenous culture. All cultures, if you go back, yeah, you'll find some things that weren't, by today's standard or any standard, weren't pleasant, but it was mm. what was done. Can I ask you then, you've expressed reservations about whether you think the voice is a mechanism that will help or not help. Mm. Can we open that up a bit? How do you see it and why do you have reservations? Oh, I have... I, where to start? Well, I guess the, the main one is it's premised on Indigenous people don't have a voice. 
And I, I'd like to know, in what sense do I not have a voice? Could someone describe that to me? And they might say, well, you're okay, Anthony, but it's other disadvantaged, poorer ones who don't have a voice. Well, just like some poorer, disadvantaged, non-Indigenous people, do you say they don't have a voice as well? And when you look at those poorer ones who are often, not always, but often in remote communities, they do have people from their, those communities communicating with leaders and Indigenous experts and that sort of thing. So the whole premise of they lack a voice, that's not a, not a good premise, it's wrong. The other matter with the voice is we haven't heard a clear plan for how it will solve the problems facing Indigenous people. We just hear, well, what we've done hasn't worked, and I agree with that. But then there's this bit of a jump of, well, it hasn't worked, so therefore this thing must work. Not necessarily. I mean, it's, we should con consider it with other options, but I haven't seen a good plan, a logical argument for how this mechanism will address the problems we know exist uh, that are affecting far too many Indigenous people. And, you know, we know the right, the right areas, and Linda Burney has mentioned this, you know, employment, education, and, you know, many people have mentioned that, but we do have to do to close the gap we do have to do some hard work and have some tough conversations which many people don't like doing and this whole thing of a voice is a nice neat little package it's much more easier much more easy to comprehend and accept and to me to use a uh, analogy or well, i don't know if analogy is the right word but something similar i've said before we had the same expectations about oh, once we get an Indigenous person as the Minister for Indigenous Affairs, that will fix things, that will make things different. Well, we had Mr White, and no disrespect to Mr White, it didn't make any difference. Apparently he wasn't the right sort of Indigenous person in the eyes of some. So we got a new person, Indigenous person, filling that portfolio. Again, we haven't seen any improvements. So again, I'm not disrespecting Burning or white, I'm just saying, you know, the simple solution of just put an Indigenous person there in the, in the portfolio and that'll fix the problems is nonsense. And I think having this new thing called the voice, where it gives voice to Indigenous people and they've already got voices, again, nice, neat little package doesn't do the hard yard so. Well, one key argument that uh, people put up in support of the voice is that it's been designed by Indigenous. Australians, that's point one, and secondly, that it's overwhelmingly supported by them. Um, according to this view, voting yes to it is a profound step towards reconciliation. I'd have to say we're not seeing much reconciliation at the moment. It's divided yeah. us down the middle as a yeah. country. But, but do you think it has been really designed by Indigenous people? Well, when you say them, you, <coughs> in that sense, you mentioned the word them, designed by them or something. and. Well, I meant designed by, they say, yeah. by Indigenous them, yeah. people. What, is that, what does that word them mean? You know, when we say them referring to Indigenous people, this group, this group, this, you know, whoever. I mean, it really should be some Indigenous people have supported and some have not. Where the split is, I don't know, but I certainly know there, is, there are many in both camps. But we shouldn't assume that this is what the Indigenous people want. We should be honest and say this is what some Indigenous people want. And... <clears throat> what I find particularly interesting is we know that the Indigenous architects who could be the Indigenous architects of the voice who we should call, I guess, the, the leaders <coughs> of this movement, this, the voice thing, mm. they've done very, very well without the voice and without treaties and that sort of thing. So I, I see a problem there. They should be using their voices to say, hey, to all the, those in disadvantaged Indigenous people, if you want what I've got, you've got to do what I've got. You've got to walk the path that I've, I've walked. And like I said earlier on, <coughs> they've either been born into good circumstances or they've escaped bad, bad circumstances and got themselves into good circumstances where they had access to safe environments, uh, fresh food, vegetable shelter, educational opportunities, those sorts of things. But, you know, to assume that this blanket statement that the Indigenous people want it, mm. that's a bit misleading. 
The, the reason that I personally was initially, very early on, decided I didn't feel I could support this, quite frankly, was that I just genuinely and passionately believe that the Constitution of the Nation should be a dry, dusty document uh, that doesn't romanticise in any way, shape or form, and that it shouldn't distinguish between Australians on any basis at all. Um, and in as much as it does already, that mm. perhaps should be the subject of a constitutional convention to work out whether it's wise to have those references that are in there now. Mm. And a few other things like the States Commission that hasn't met since the 1920s. Maybe we need to tidy that up. But, but this is a really important point. I find that 11 years ago, Noel Pearson, who now wants to put something in the Constitution, believed then it was a very bad idea, and I'm quoting him. As long as the allowance of racial discrimination remains in our Constitution, because it's there in very mild form already, it continues in both subtle and unsubtle ways to affect our relationships with each other. Though it has historically hurt my people more than others, racial categorizations dehumanise us all. It dehumanises us because we are each individuals and we should be judged as individuals. We should be rewarded on our merits and assisted in our needs. Race should not matter. Hmm. Amen. He's just encapsulated why I don't believe this should be embedded in the Constitution for one main reason. I'll come to the other reason in a moment. But, but what, why has it changed? You can say the same in America. I mean, you had Martin Luther King. He was a hero for hmm. saying it wants to be about, he wanted it to be about character, not about skin colour. Now in America, it's all about skin colour. Why has someone like Noel, and I don't dispute that he cares deeply about <coughs> Indigenous people, don't dispute that for a moment, but just 11 years ago he was saying any reference to race in the Constitution is a bad idea for his people and for Australians. Now he has a different view. How, how do you see that? Why, why has he done that? Yeah. Oh, I don't know, to be honest. Um, he's been swept up uh, in the movement, wants to be part of this revolutionary thing, but perhaps he's looking for his own Martin Luther King moment. Yeah. I don't know, I agree with you, he does care for indigenous people, but... Um, so what I'll tell you what I find outrageous about it. There'll be people who'll say, oh, you're racist for not <coughs> wanting this in the constitution. But here's Noel Pearson just a few years ago, mounting the very reason that I don't think it should be in the constitution. Nobody says he's racist. <laughs> Um, yeah, it does seem to be a double standard. Um, and, you know, we make too big a fuss about race. I'm not saying we should pretend it doesn't exist. But certainly when I used to do guest lectures around the place for uni students, which was always a pleasure, and I would always let people know, I yes, I have Aboriginal ancestry, I have non-Aboriginal ancestry, English ancestry, a few, perhaps a few other things. I'm from South East Queensland, I'm a Sydney person now, I'm heterosexual, I have Christian values, I'm male, and I have all these things that make up yeah. who I am. If you elevate any one of those significantly above the others, you're going to have problems. That's right? identity politics. Yeah, and so we sh you know, should um, not just pull out one thing and elevate it, but you know, see the whole person, realise that, yeah, okay, race is there, but it's one mm. thing. Uh, and coming back to what I was saying before, recognising these differences is fine, but only after first establishing the foundation of recognising the commonalities, mm. which far outweigh the differences. Amen. Um, and the second reason that I really, and this goes to the heart of why I don't believe this model will work, it's precisely because you are going to put it into the Constitution for the reasons that Noel Pearson outlined and believed in 11 years ago, mm. I actually think what will happen is it'll create an activist picnic ground. Won't be mainstream Aboriginal people <coughs> just wanting to get on with their lives mm. or wanting to be lifted out of difficulties. It'll be the activists. Let's be honest about this. Mm. I mean, Marcia Langton made the point that Aboriginal politics is often very vicious and you do see some very ugly activism. I think activists will look to make trouble with this. Remember, we don't know the detail of what it's going to look like. But it'll almost certainly be something activists will want to use. And that will rebound 
in the same way that it does if you show favouritism <coughs> to a kid in a classroom, yeah. where the rest of the community is saying, you're just making trouble. Mm. And I, I, in the absence of any real detail about what this thing's going to look like, which is insulting in itself, asking us to pass a bank check, mm. if you have that problem, it will backfire very badly. I well, think, against Indigenous people. And also with the activists, you may have lawyers whispering in their ears. Yeah. If anything to do with the Constitution, if you change it, there's going to be new interpretations. Oh, it'll lend itself to new interpretations and that sort of thing. So, um, But, you know, I'm not a legal expert, so I won't say much more. Anyway, um, it, it is, to me, it's very concerning. Tell me, um, the argument over whether the Uluru Statement is just one page or whether it's 26 or whether it's 120, um, I don't know whether you have any thoughts on that, but certainly it does seem you can't get away from the fact that that supporting document indicates that, as one person put it, the voice is a hook for other things like treaties yeah. and reparations. Sure. And look, I think most of us already knew that. Yeah. Uh, it was there in one way or another. So, yeah, I don't get hung up in that debate whether it's one page or 26 mm. pages or whatever, but we just knew from reading that one page and then all the other commentary yeah. and that mm. around it where it was going, you know, and, you know, you hear truth-telling, treaty and mm. Macarada and all that sort of thing. Um, so, the most incarcerated race on earth with yeah. no contextualisation. Yeah. You know, so, when I've had Aboriginal mm. women saying to me, they honestly think there should be more of their young men for their behaviour. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we've talked about that. So um, the thing that worries me about this is, I made this point the other day, and, and you were present at a public meeting. This is a free country. And if the Prime Minister believes, and if the Minister for Aboriginal and Indigenous Affairs believes, if the Cabinet believes, if politicians believe, yes, we should have the voice, treaty, reparations, truth-telling. This is a free country. You are to us to say, I believe these are good things and we should do it. But it's all surrounded by an attempt to deny what is the plain intent of the Uluru Statement, which is to progress these very things. Yeah. And, and as you say, it doesn't matter whether it's the one page or the multi-page. What I'm driving at here is that this looks like an effort to keep the mugs in the dark and not be really honest and upfront about what you're trying to do. And that strikes at the heart of trust. And you'll never get the country operating properly if we continue to break trust. I agree, it, it will keep people squabbling. Tell me- and, You know, a, mm. a house divided against itself can yeah. stand. And that's, the, that's what makes me weep as an Australian. Mm. And we've talked about it, you know, the constant division rather than the focus on mm. what unites us. Um, the, ad, the idea of, um, of Makarata, it's a new word for a lot of people, or a Makarata Commission. What does it likely entail? And what does Makarata really mean? Look, uh, like many words, there's different meanings attached to it. You know, some will uh, rightly say that you know, it meant putting a spear through someone's thigh. And of course, that's not what they mean today, but you know, that was one use mm. of the word. Again, I'm no expert, but uh, it generally it means, you know, coming together, peace, after a struggle. Okay, so, you know, it, they're using it to um, say, we, you know, we want, we've had a struggle, we want peace. So that's my understanding of it. Again, it's a, it's a term that needs to be unpacked and it can be in, interpreted differently. So it's what psychologists would say, we need it operationalised, you know, what are the specific component steps of it? That raises the question then, mm -hmm. fair enough, um, if, you, if you adopt that approach. But it raises the question as to at what point... See, forgiveness, if I can put it that way, it's a, it's a two-way street in a way. If I've wronged you and I say I'm sorry, it's not going to work unless you say I accept the apology, let's move on. Mm -hmm. And that's what's worrying me about this. And also, also, if you say sorry, it should be you who have decided to, to say sorry, not you've been forced or coerced into it. It should come from the heart. You say sorry because you want to. I agree sorry. with that. Mm. Um, but I, well, what I'm like is yeah. a lot of people are being pushed in, forced into this, yeah. you know, say sorry. Well, a lot of them probably <coughs> feel too that they've not done anything wrong. Mm. You know, I've not dispossessed anybody. No. Generations before me, you know, there may mm. be some arguments around that. Yeah, but and look, and at that public meeting, <coughs> which we were both at, 
I just, because of the way I didn't plan to say this, the, because of the way the conversation was going, I said to the group there, look, what your great-great-grandfathers may have done to my great-great-grandfathers has nothing to do with how I relate to you today. Mm -hmm. But we now hear, it was in the weekend press, of two little four-year-olds coming home very upset because they'd been asked to apologise mm. to the rest of the class. Mm. And, um, you know, apparently uh, we've been terrible uh, and we're really upset about it. Mm. But they've done nothing wrong. Uh, that, and that is absurd. If, you know, if it really happened like that, that is absolutely absurd and ridiculous and shameful. And it just brings up divisions and hurts that are not contextualised, so it can't be worked through mm. and becomes part of the power struggle, which in the end disadvantages everyone. Anthony, you've, you've given us in thought through ways, non-emotional ways, caring ways, no name calling sort of ways, why you have reservations about the voice. Thank you for that. Any further thoughts on it? No, just that it's, well, yes. Every, everyone wants to help Aboriginal Australians. We know that. On the referendum day, you'll have this question, I can't remember the exact words of it, but for a lot of people I think they're going to be thinking in their minds, you know, they'll read these words, but then the question will be, do you want to help Aboriginal people? Yeah. That's not the question, that's not what you're voting on. Yeah. So I would just say to people, on the referendum day, just be aware of what you are, what your yes or no is going for, you know, particularly yes, you're not voting for yes, I want to help Aboriginal people. It's, you're voting for, yes, I want this thing called the voice mm. enshrined in the constitution. Now, if it was that enshrinement th then directly led to improving the health and well-being of Aboriginal people, well then I'd be voting for it m myself, but I, I have not heard the plan for how that will be. And what I do find amusing is we've had some leaders, should I name them? I guess so. We've had someone like Mr Albanese on the project and elsewhere, trying to articulate how it will help Aboriginal people and he wasn't successful at it. There was no gotcha moments, they weren't trying to get him, they were asking him direct questions and he was not able to explain it. Similarly, Linda Burney has also been asked how it will help Aboriginal people. And you know, we just get the same platitudes, it will give them voice, that sort of thing. Well, they already have voices. So I have not seen this clear plan of how this thing called the voice will translate into better health and well, you know, better outcomes for Indigenous people. If someone was to show it to me, I might vote yes, but I have not seen it yet. And the leaders haven't been able to do it. So that's my final. I've used my voice to talk about the voice. Thomas Sowell is plainly saying in America, and he's such a giant that no one dares challenge him, of course, intellectually, that there are people who have an interest in maintaining racism, which, as we've discussed, is just another form of hatred, which destroys hater and hated. Who has an incentive to keep racism alive, do you think? Oh, uh, well, at least keep the claims of racism mm. going, because I don't think it's a big problem here in Australia. The, the claims, the allegations of it is a bigger problem than mm. the racism itself. And there are people who benefit from that. Uh, you know, some academics, for example, have made nice little careers for themselves of publishing papers on, you know, every problem facing Indigenous Australians is due to this ongoing systemic endemic racism. And yet I don't see the any good evidence for that. Um, they might say, well, you know, when you look at all the disadvantage, that's just obviously from racism. No, it's not obviously mm. from racism. It, it, it puts, it's a disincentive to for Indigenous people to want to try and get ahead if they think, well, you know, why, why would I try? Racism's only going to beat me at the end of the day. So, and that just keeps people down. And when you've got Indigenous people kept down, that creates jobs for people who have then got to manage them. I must tell you, I had an extraordinary moment on the ABC, our publicly funded broadcaster, on one of their premier programs, where the compare was mounting the argument that all of the problems in Indigenous communities stem from frontier violence. And I was arguing that that does not mean that 
Aboriginal men in particular don't have a responsibility to change their behaviour and to be protective of particularly the, the, the mothers of their children and their children. And what was absolutely extraordinary to me, and I, 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 to this day I recall it with great anger, to be honest, was that there was another very fine young Indigenous man on the panel that I was on. He was a very gentle fellow, and he's sitting beside me saying, no to the compare, you're wrong. John's right on this. An Indigenous person saying, my people must accept responsibility, must accept agency, Noel Pearson used to call it. But there was a sophisticated, well-to-do, well-paid, I'll say it, white woman hmm. saying I was relying on anecdotal evidence over all of the academic research that shows that it's the result of frontier violence. Hmm. But here's an Indigenous person, lived experience, saying softly and all I wanted to do was to say all right Madam Compe, my friend thinks you're wrong and I'm right hmm. but I didn't feel I wanted to do that to that young man. Yeah. Look, you it left a really bad taste in my mouth. The academic research is often often it's not just research it's just claims which gets published in a journal and then once it's in a journal particularly when you throw in these, these terms peer-reviewed People think it takes on this aura of truth. Very often it's just a person's opinion who's quoted someone else who agrees with them. Oh, it's you know due to colonization and that sort of thing. Well, again, if you know the violence that we see is due to colonization, how can you explain why is it we see so many good indigenous men yeah. who look after their families? How did they dodge the colonization bullet? So, you know, it's a little bit like, so, you know, if an astrologer said to me, Leos are all creative people. Well, what about all the Leos who aren't creative and all the non-Leos who are creative? You can't just mm. cherry pick something to support mm. a narrative. There's a lot of evidence against this view that the violence we see today is the result of colonisation. Well, this young man was actually saying to me and then in conversation mm. afterwards, it was very interesting. He was saying for years, I played the victim card and then I realised how hopeless that was and I was really selling myself short mm. by not accepting responsibility, agency. That's what he was actually saying. Mm. He said, I got nowhere when I thought it was somebody else's fault and I could blame them. It was only when I realised I had responsibility and I had to mm. shape up that I was able to pick my life up. And he was on the program because he was making a success of his life. Mm. And then the program doesn't give him the opportunity to explain to the listeners. Didn't fit their narrative. Didn't fit the narrative. Yeah. And that is a terrible content. I'll be, I'll be blunt again, of so much of what now happens at the ABC. Yeah, but uh, they've um, been a, a contributor to a lot of the problems. You know, look, to their credit, I see sometimes they do say some good things. They do report on some unpleasant things in Aboriginal communities. That's good, but they need to be doing a lot more of that. Now you see senior people at the ABC, though, telling their reporters what how to yeah. shut down parts of the debate. Mm. It's been an absolute delight talking to you, and I salute you for your quiet, calm courage. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure being here.